So with that being said, I'd like to formally introduce our guest tonight. Uh, Dr. Ella Moodle is an assistant professor of urology at the University of Michigan. But I think most importantly for this talk tonight, uh, he's also the medical director of virtual care for University of Michigan Medical Group and the principal investigator of the Telehealth Research Incubator Lab. As a busy clinical urologist, uh, he still found time to become a true subject expert in telehealth an instrumental role in telehealth research and policy the past few years. He's an R01 funded researcher as a subject expert in telehealth and has been invited to speak about virtual care to the US Department of Health and Human Services, to NPR radio, to Freakonomics radio, and probably the biggest stage of them all, this fireside chat tonight hosted by the AUA Advocacy Resident Work Group. That was awesome. So, um, <laughs> Like I said, the purpose of this chat tonight is ultimately to learn more about how we as residents or fellows or students or anyone on the call tonight can maximize our impact and policy through research. Uh, I think he has a few slides to share, and so I'll just let you get started now, and we'll kind of see where things head from there. All right. You can see the slides? Slides are perfect. Okay, good. I might just do it in this like sorter mode because I have like a couple screens and stuff, so I think it's just easier this way. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, you know, when, when Ben was like, hey, can you do this like fireside chat? I was like, yeah, let me just throw together this 45 minute lecture and it'll be, you know, it'll be, it'll be perfect. That's exactly what you want right now. Um, so I will, uh, uh, I do have a few slides and, you know, appreciating that this is a smaller group, which is fantastic. We can definitely do a lot more kind of talking and, um, and kind of, um, you know, uh, discussion as opposed to going through, and I, I I see a lot of the names here. I recognize people, um, and you've been you've been very involved in policy at the AUA and and beyond. So um, I think this is be a, a great great discussion. And so as as Ben introduced me already, um, you know, in in general, I've been very interested in virtual care for a long time, and so and now, and I've also always been interested in healthcare policy. So after. Um, college. I worked at the uh, Medicare Payment Advisory, so I was worked in D.C. I was very interested in healthcare policy and always wanted, that was an economics major, and always wanted to tie healthcare policy with uh, with the clinical work that I was doing. And so um, I feel like at this stage of my career, I'm able to do that. You know, I especially, especially in the in the space of virtual care, I see patients um, in my clinical practice virtually, the medical director of virtual care for our health system, and then also um, you know, on the research side too. And this has always been a big goal of mine. And you know, each one of these, as you'll see, um, as I talk through some of the principles of maximizing research, um, healthcare policy research um, impact, uh, you'll see that it, you know, these tie in together very much. So, um, and you know, I'm, so this talk is basically on seven principles that I think. And you know, I was when I was given this invitation to talk, it was great because I was able. This is something I've really been passionate about, but really I've never sat down and kind of synthesized what I've learned. I mean, I didn't have a playbook to go with. You know, I just kind of uh, learned from practice. And then um, after six years of being on faculty here, I've kind of realized that there's really a few specific areas where you can make the highest impact or what you can do to get your research out there. And I think um, that's how I was able to distill it into this talk. And, and you know, I'll, I'm putting up this slide not to brag about things I've done, but I just think it's like important that I do have the street cred to talk about this. And um, a lot of the stuff that you see here, I'm very excited about, but you may never ever see on my resume or see on my CV, you know, being able to present to folks at the Department of Health and Human Services at the Office of Inspector General. These are, these were big things for me, probably not big things for them because they were, it was just talking to them, but I really felt like um, you know, I was being heard at a pretty high level, and um, that was very meaningful to me. And so, um, you know, when I think about these seven principles, um, I think these are really important. And um, and these are the seven principles that I think are important to help maximize the impact of the research that you're doing. And um, there's other ways to maximize impact, but this is very specific for, for research. Number one is to have, and I'll go through each one of these principles in detail and we can talk about them, but number one is to have this dissemination focused mindset, uh, which we don't always have. You know, we kind of think of publication as like the final uh, frontier. You got the paper published, let's celebrate, which you should. But I think in reality, that's kind of the bare minimum. So you need to have the publication so that you have the credibility to talk about what you're presenting to policymakers and so forth. But um, it, to get that work out there, it takes a lot more work. And I'll talk about that. Uh, becoming a subject matter expert is very important, especially early on in your career. Um, creating a strategy based on your audience's needs. And I know a lot of people in this room already know that because you're you know, engaged in policy work. 
uh, creating scalable research products. And I'll talk a little bit about how I've done that. Uh, making ideas memorable. I'm also going to give some plugs for some key books that I've told Juan about and others that I've mentored over the years um, that are have been really influential in my career. So I'll talk about that. Um, establishing distribution channels. I'll talk about how I've done that uh, to automate the process of getting your information out there. Um, and then also this concept of the compound effect, which I think is really important early on in your career. Um, so, you know, the first one is this idea of having a dissemination focused mindset. We don't technically we don't always have this in medicine. You know, I think we tend to have this uh, mindset of produce um, high quantities of uh, producing high quantity. And, um, you know, that it, it does kind of hold us down. You know, we spent a lot of time coming up with this idea, producing an analysis, uh, getting, you know, ab abstracts into the AUA and then getting that publication. And that, again, is just really the, the beginning of this process. And, um, each year, these were stats I just pulled off the internet. Each year, there's 770,000 citation, new citations in, in PubMed. And you, know, you, you may have heard that it takes about 17 years to get evidence into, into actual practice. So really, the, the majority of this effort is in dissemination. And, um, and that also kind of speaks to the fact that uh, if it takes a lot of time and effort and attention and focus to disseminate your work, then you probably don't have the time to work on five different projects that are in five different areas. And that's gonna, that kind of ties into the next one. But, um, you know, I, when, I remember when Juan was a chief resident here, you know, he was heading towards fellowship. He had a lot of publications under his belt. So he, he's gotten over that bibliopenia that we all have to do to get to the next stage of our life. And I told him, you know, during your last year, just focus on a single project. Let's do one project together that you're really passionate about, that you're going to be able to talk about, that you really think is going to make an impact. And, you know, we can talk about that project. And I think he did. And, you know, it was really proud for me to see him work on that. But, you know, it it, it certainly wasn't easy just to focus on one thing because you have all these other priorities. But um, I think in, in the end, you'll just be happier uh, with that product, um, with that particular project. And so... Um, that kind of ties into this concept of becoming a subject matter expert. You know, you, you are all subject matter experts. Um, we're, you know, all physicians. And so our first layer of expertise is uh, being, uh, being a physician. And that is really important uh, when you're having um, these conversations with, um, you know, whoever your stakeholders are that you're having conversations. We're also a urologist, um, telehealth expert. And, and from that, for that um, I come from multiple different angles, including the operational administrative leadership angle, the, um, um, the research angle. So I have that part. And then I've always really been interested in health services research. And so I'm a health services researcher. So I, instead of doing clinical trials in, um, in virtual care, I, do, I focus on the delivery system. I focus on cost, quality, and access, which is valuable for certain populations and stakeholders. And then on top of that, I, I have expertise in health in claims-based research, so doing using national data sets. So I don't do interviews. I don't do um, small uh, kind of chart review type projects. These are more larger population-based studies. And then if you want to get even deeper, um, I work in a single data set, which is called Medicare. And so, um, you know, when, when you get to that very, very end of this arrow, you go from, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people that are like you, thousands of people that are like you to like a few people in the country that are like you. And I think it's really important. You should be able to go back and forth. Like if you're talking to a journalist, you don't want to only use that one expertise at the very end. You want to be able to back up and talk as a, you know, a general physician. Um, and, but, but, you know, having that expertise is really important when you get into certain types of conversations like the when you're talking to um, other stakeholders in the government, for example, that are interested in what's happening to the Medicare population, they really want to know the fact that you have a certain level of expertise to be able to actually, you know, talk about uh, research that you're presenting. And I, I know I'm kind of laying this out about how I became in, in, in my particular area, but I think that this applies to everyone. You just have to kind of pick your lane. Um, this is one of the plugs I'll give for the book. Uh, it's called The One Thing. And I think that was really influential early on in my career where I sort of did focus on a single lane, but um, I never was worried about pivoting. So you have this lane, you dig deeper, dig deeper, dig deeper, but like, don't worry. You can, if you decide that you find something that is worth, worth your time, then you can pivot. And that's what happened to me when I was, uh, when I first started on fellowship, I was really interested in health policy research, alternative payment models. That was kind of my my thing. And then I clinically had an interest in virtual care, but then 
um, I was presented a, an opportunity to write a review paper. And my, I talked to my mentor about that. And he's like, are you, are you sure you want to do this? This is a pretty big, big pivot. And I was like, I really believe in this area. And that's when I became, um, you know, interested in it. And I started to, then I put all my eggs into that, into that basket. So you can pivot. You just have to know that, um, you know, you, even if you pivot, you have to really get, become an expert in that area. Um, the next principle is creating a strategy based on your audience's needs. So like um, when you do have a research uh, publication, um, who do you want that? Um, who, who's your audience? Where, who do you want to get it out to? Um, to uh, is it the lay audience, uh, physicians? Is it to uh, policymakers or is it scientific community? And understanding the audience that you want to get um, your information out to is going to impact the research products. And we'll talk about products in a little bit. Uh, but the where you submit your work, you know, if you're writing blog articles, the level of detail, the tone, and you know, of course, like literacy levels are really important for this uh, this type of work, uh, this type of work. And um, the most important principle here is this concept of the curse of knowledge. Um, so the curse of knowledge is that when you know too much or you know a lot about a topic, it's hard to uh, easily translate that to a, a different audience. And there's this like story about the curse of knowledge where um, they did this study where uh, they had individuals tap out a song and, um, you know, they, they were tapping it out and they, um, so they have the song in their head and they're supposed to tap it out. And then um, the, they, they asked those people that were tapping it out, what percentage of uh, respondents are going to be able to recognize the song? And they believe that about 50% of people would be able to recognize the song that they're tapping out. In reality, it was like one or 2%. So um, in, for the most part, when you know so much about a topic, it's hard to actually bring it down to a level that other people are going to understand. And that's an important thing that you have to pay attention to. Um, the next principle is uh, creating these scalable research product products. And the scalable is an important word here because we don't have, um, you know, especially as busy clinicians, you're not going to have a lot of time to, you know, um, come up with things from scratch, but you know, if you you know created a thing, if you created a product like a research brief, for example, and um, there's uh, some images of things that I've created over the years, and there's a link to that research brief down below. Um, but if you created a research brief, you know, having the template there so that you can recreate it for the next research project um, is really important to improve your um, um, you know improve your uh, productivity. Nobody wants a research article uh, forwarded to them, so forwarding a research art article to house staff or uh, you know, other organizations is just really going to go nowhere. They'll say thanks, but uh, in reality, they're not going to take the time to read it, understand it, um, unless it's um, really basically spoon fed to them using these different types of research products. Um, Making Ideas Memorable, this is the next book that I highly recommend to everyone. And I know that we don't have a lot of time to read. So there's a, a link to a YouTube summary there. But um, this, this concept this is written by two authors that focus on making ideas stick. Um, and they have this general conceptual framework here uh, called success. Um, ideas need to be simple. And by simple, it's that doesn't mean dumb it down. Simple means that you just stick to a core message. Um, so you kind of take all the fluff around what you're uh, uh, sending and you just come down to a single core message. Um, you can use when you're telling the ideas or when you're you know kind of translating or communicating information, you can make it unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional stories. Some of the stuff is self-explanatory, but I do recommend either watching the video or reading the book because they go into a lot of detail into how these principles can be used in your work. And I think it's important, not just for researchers um, in this context of disseminating information to policymakers, but also for uh, you know, just everything that you do in life. So I think that's a, it's a great book to pick up. Um, establishing distribution channels. This is part of making your work automated. Um, and so uh, you shouldn't have to individually reach out to um, stakeholders uh, to uh, submit your information or submit any new research that you have. Um, have. Have these automated, have distribution channels that you can create over the years. Um, as an example for myself, um, I worked with our government relations folks to uh, create this listserv of um, people are interested in telehealth research, and it's over 100 plus people now, um, stakeholders, CMS, stakeholders, HHS, if I have any conversations or meetings, or if I meet anyone and talk about virtual care, I add them to the listserv, and over the years it grows and gets bigger and bigger, and that's how you, and no, nope, they may not respond to you if you send um, something out about a new, uh, an abstract or a project that you did, uh, but at the same time, it's getting in their inbox and they know you exist, um, which is going to serve useful later. Uh, when um, they need to talk to someone. And um, the other listserv is research, um, 
network that I created um, among people, a faculty at U of M across specialties that are interested. Um, personal contacts with journalists, like after you talk to them, keep in contact with them. Um, then, you know, I, there's a couple of journalists that reach out to me um, that will ask about it. There's a new policy, a telehealth policy out there, they'll ask my opinion on it. You got to kind of pay it forward. Sometimes, um, you know, you'll have a phone, 30 minute phone call with them and it, you know, it's just information gathering and sometimes they quote you. And so I think, um, you know, you just keeping that relationship is important. Um, and then of course, like our own organization, like the American, Tele, uh, American um, uh, Urologic Association, AUA, there's plenty of task force and other committees that you can be part of, which I know a lot of the folks here are part of those committees, uh, but other advocacy agent uh, organizations as well, too. And so like the ATA and Alliance for Connected Care, they're just looking for content, you know, and so if you have a nicely summarized article, uh, research article that you put together and you send it to the ATA, they will blast it on their list of 10,000 stakeholders because their job is to get information like that out there. So, um, you know, there's going to be a similar organization for whatever area you're interested in. And, um, you know, they're, they're craving content. And same thing with the folks that work in external relations. They want contact. They, there's nothing more exciting to them than having researchers that are engaged in dissemination and they want to work with you and they'll put in a lot of effort because, um, you know, that's, that's their job and they want to do a good job at, their, um, at what they're doing. Um, and then finally, the, the last principle is uh, have faith in the compound effect. Um, and so this, this idea, and I'm sure you, know, you guys probably all heard of the compound effect, just doing small things over time can lead to big effects. And, um, and it, you know, I, I don't think I really realized that until I was you know, mid-career, um, is that um, it seems like sometimes you're on a hamster wheel and you're doing these small things, small projects. And then, uh, but over time, like if you're creating scalable projects, products that you use over and over and over again, um, the gains are just so dramatic. If you're constantly keeping in talk, contact with certain journalists or reaching out to certain stakeholders, um, even though these in interactions are very minor, um, in five years, in 10 years, they become very significant. And have faith that that will happen, even if you don't feel like you're getting the returns on your investment right away. So um, that's it. Those are kind of the main, um, air, uh, main topics that I wanted to talk about or principles of dissemination. So I'm happy to, you know, uh, dig it deeper into any one of these areas.